Hey, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, this is a, a true pleasure to moderate this uh, panel. Uh, uh, it is not just the, the, the topic that uh, we will be um, uh, discussing uh, this morning, but uh, it is also uh, a great pleasure to be on a panel uh, with people from actually quite uh, different uh, backgrounds and uh, um, I'm sure you have uh, uh, read the um, uh, the uh, today's program and there's uh, literally one line uh, to uh, uh, you know characterize each of the panelists but uh, uh, from what I know uh, their experience is much much richer and uh, also uh, there are uh, numerous sort of uh, facts in and, uh, and, and occurrences in their lives, professional lives, uh, that uh, make them particularly uh, relevant uh, contributors to this uh, panel. And therefore, I would like to start with a um, uh, very brief uh, introduction uh, from each of the panelists uh, just to you know, uh, uh, say a few sentences, uh, what uh, is your, you know, background and what is your experience in the area of, of good governance? And uh, uh, perhaps I would like to start with uh, Madam Chigana. So, thank you so much. Uh, I am very happy to be participating in this panel. I am currently actually having a long-standing, um, uh, very good, fruitful collaboration with the Riga Graduate School of Law because I am one of the lecturers uh, for uh, including the audience that we are addressing today. Uh, I have a long experience with governance, uh, governance issues. I have been the civil society activist. I have been a politician for eight years in the Latvian parliament. And currently I'm working as an international consultant uh, including in the countries of uh, Eastern Partnership, Central Asia, Caucasus, and uh, with such important governance issues as elections. What can be more important these days? Sure. Um, um, and um, now uh, um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Peter Goldschmidt. Yanis, thank you uh, very much. Um, Honorable colleagues from the panel, uh, but uh, first of all, to uh, our good colleagues and friends at the RGSL, thank you for the invitation uh, to participate in today's session. My name is uh, Peter. I'm the director of the Luxembourg Center of the European Institute of Public Administration that has its headquarters in Maastricht. At uh, IPAS, as we call ourselves for short, um, Luxembourg Center. We are um, been working also with the IGSL for so many years that I don't even want to say it because it makes me feel very old. And I started that corporation <laughs> way back. So, but I must go at least uh, eight or ten years back. And today we are very, I'm very proud that two of our best. Uh, um, lecturers are contributing uh, to the advanced program um, initially with face-to-face -face, but currently of course with online sessions. My own background very briefly, I'm a lawyer, I'm sorry. Um, it was a choice I did when I was young and unexperienced, what can I say? Uh, but uh, I have since then worked as a private sector lawyer and as a lawyer in in the Danish government and in the European Commission um, before joining the wonderful world of training and capacity building, uh, first for the Danish School of Public Administration and now uh, here since 1997 with, with um, so last century, uh, with, with the European Institute of Public Administration. And of course, what we do is supporting countries uh, in their uh, member states, but also countries neighboring the EU and who wish to become members of the EU in exactly the topics we're talking about here, good governance, uh, rule, respect of rule of law, implementing the law correctly and fairly and ensuring equal opportunity. And those are the issues I look forward to, the combination of 
of the role of public administration working with the judiciary to ensure uh, respect of an implementation of good governance on all levels is what I'm looking forward to discussing with my right honorable colleagues today. Thank you so much for giving me the floor at this moment. Okay, thank you. And uh, last not least, uh, Mr. Martin Škrievich. Uh, good morning, Janis, Peter, Loleta, uh, dear participants of the conference. Um, thanks a lot for having me on the panel. Uh, very good to see you. Sadly enough, not uh, in person in Riga, but I'm quite sure that as uh, Mrs. Zandakalni and Lukasiewicz mentioned, uh, next year will be better. My name is Martin Škrenč, as Janis already said. Uh, as you can judge from my uh, uh, corporate background, I work currently as a senior policy advisor uh, for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and uh, Development. And taking the opportunity, uh, I want to thank uh, both the governments of uh, Latvia, Norway, and also the United States for assisting uh, and contributing to the work of the OECD and allowing us to build better policies for better lives. Uh, previously, in my professional career, I've done quite a bit in the Latvian civil service. I have also been part of the civil society. I had also worked as a Lolita currently as a freelance uh, consultant, and I've done that in, uh, all, I think, almost all of the Eastern Partnership countries, definitely all of the Western Balkan countries, and some bits and pieces also of the uh, Central Asia. My biggest field of expertise are the centers of the government, the policy development in general, strategic planning, and of course, the reform of the public administration which we will be partially covering also during this uh, panel and i'm looking forward to the discussions we will be having on the uh, very good questions uh, i'm sure Janis has prepared for us uh, but actually to take the dialogue on the good governance issues further so that we can really advance uh, on these issues in uh, all over the world Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for these introductions. And as uh, uh, you could see, we, we really have uh, not only a diverse uh, range of participants, but we also have a very rich uh, background. So we have, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, uh, experience in, in the non-governmental sector in uh, in, in also essentially in, in research and, and training we also have uh, people with uh, a solid experience in 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 the uh, public sector in, in the management of public bodies uh and that i think uh makes a very good starting point uh for our discussion and uh, uh i i um uh really wonder uh and quite honestly i i really wonder uh what is it that we understand when we say good governance? Uh, well, first of all, there is a slight puzzle of what is governance at all. But in particular, when we look at what is good governance, is, is it something that, you know, is it nice looking people? Is it just, uh, you know, uh, nice news stories? What, what is it when you say good governance? What, what do you mean? Who's going to start? Peter, you, you must start because uh, you you do the training, so you should have a, a ready-made answer. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm going to divide it a bit so that uh, my right honorable colleagues, uh, Martins and Lolita, can also, uh, let's say, join in and, 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 and not, um, I don't try to cover all the aspects because good governance are so many different things. And, uh, and I think what I'll do is I'll just focus maybe on, on three, three of the points, uh, being a lawyer and, uh, and being originally Danish. Uh, so uh, the, the first of these would be, of course, the respect of, of rule of law. Uh, if we don't have uh, respect of rule of law, what does that actually mean? Well, to put it very simply and non-academically, 
it means respecting the rules that apply in a country. Uh, it means uh, that everyone is treated equally under those rules and that they apply equally uh, to all. Uh, and, and last but not least, that the laws are in compliance with the, uh, the constitutions and international treaties and agreements that we have entered into. And it also means the independence and neutrality of the justice sector. All of these things are important because ultimately a public administration, even when trying to do its best, can make can have an opinion where private individuals, citizens feel that this is not the correct interpretation. And of course, then the, the courts have to be able to rule in such cases and objectively based on the facts and the law of the country. Second point uh, I, I want to talk about very briefly, and I'm quite sure that my two colleagues will elaborate further on this, is the accountability. The people are accountable. Decision makers are accountable, whether they are politicians or whether they are um, civil servants or whether they are judges, their decisions impact other people. Uh, so good governance is that this accountability is objectified, of course, but also that it is applied and that you are not let off the hook just because you're friends with the prime minister or uh, a thing like that. The third point I'd like to mention, and here my Danish background comes in, I suppose, is transparency. It should be transparent what the rules are. It should be transparent how they are being applied. And it should be transparent how decisions are taken. Uh, these are all important, uh, three, for me, very important elements of, of good governance. They're not just theories, they are practice. And maybe just before I give the floor to the other colleagues, maybe I would come up with an anecdote because we have been, we were involved for many, many years, uh, more than 14 years in a project uh, where we were training and develop the developing the judiciary in the uh, North African countries, the Southern Mediterranean countries. And one of those activities, we were talking and discussing about fraud. And um, we were asked, uh, us uh, among the, 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 ex the Western experts and, and the, the participant experts about what was, def how did you define fraud uh, in, in the different countries? And I mentioned a very recent case from Denmark where the director of a, one of our major harbors um, in the western part of Denmark had used the company credit card to pay for a dinner for himself and his wife and uh, a couple who were their friends. And this ended, uh, when this came, what was, uh, became apparent, uh, and um, in spite of him claiming that it had actually been a mistake, he had simply mistaken credit cards. The fact is he lost his job and he had to pay, of course, the money back. And he uh, was put uh, given a three months suspended sentence. And it was very interesting to see the reaction from all the participants because how could that be considered fraud? So we have different standards in different countries. That's what I drew from this. But the important thing is to show that if this has happened to any employee, whether public or private sector, that person using a, a company credit card for something private, you are fired and it applies even to the top. And that was the lesson to be learned from that. And that is, in my view, a good example of good governance and the respect of rule of law, transparency, and accountability. So 
that was my contribution for now. And I, I don't want to take everything and all the time from, from Lolita and, and Martins. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Lolita, being a Latvian, uh, what's your take on, on good governance? Thank you. Uh, actually, Janis, um, if you permit me, I, uh, in my response, wanted to depart uh, from being a Latvian uh, sure. for a moment. Um, and uh, this is because um, uh, actually two of my uh, uh, very current uh, 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 fields of work <clears throat> and current uh, experiences um, uh, in my opinion, are very telling. And uh, since I'm a freelance consultant, probably I can uh, allow myself to be a bit uh, brazen uh, in uh, the comparisons that I will be making. But basically, uh, what I would like to um, uh, bring into the conversation are two uh, comparisons of uh, two very big countries that I have had direct experience with. One is the United States of America. They just had a presidential election and I um, uh, had a professional joy to be uh, able to observe this election from all kinds of different aspects based in Washington, DC. Quite incredible that someone can travel in these times and uh, to be a part of expert team that was looking at all aspects of how the election was prepared, how it was administered, uh, what was the role of the media, what was the role of the civil society, uh, judiciary, and so on and so forth. And uh, just immediately after my return, I am now, now teaching a class on uh, political economy of today's Russia in Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. And for this reason, I would like to capture the fundamentals of what is the good governance through these two examples of President Trump and President Vladimir Putin. And basically, these are two individuals who have opportunistically challenged the fundamentals of governance in their countries. And countries are radically different. But the fundamental challenge is similar to some extent. We can go, of course, into the details discussing uh, uh, similarities and differences. But generally, these two individuals have thrown fundamental challenges to the fundamental governance structures of their countries. And what we saw in the US, there the countries, systems, people, laws, rules, and regulations have been able to withstand it because of a longstanding tradition of good governance, because, long -standing, because of longstanding tradition of accountability, because of a longstanding tradition of transparency, all the fundamentals that Peter mentioned in his introduction. In Russia, uh, the President Putin, one, when he was still the prime minister in 99, he gave the uh, New Year's address where he was saying that he, as the prime minister and upcoming president, because probably at that time he already knew that he would be elected, he would guard all the fundamentals of democratic society, freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, religion, and whatnot. And it took very short time until he started very seriously departing from them because he got offended by the criticism he was getting for mismanaged response to the crisis that happened in Russia all the time. And there, the man at the top was able to fundamentally change the society and to make sure that it departs from all aspects of some, maybe rudimentary, but definitely some democratic norms and traditions that had already built there. So what differs in these cases is that an opportunistic man at the top can or cannot attack the system so that it changes fundamentally. And the, in the US, of course, we see that uh, the society has been bitter, bitterly divided and uh, that the debate is very acrimonious. Nevertheless, we have seen so many examples where election administers from, the, uh, 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 from, uh, from uh, different states even though they are belong, uh, belonging to the Republican Party, they are very staunchly defending principles of good governance and good elections. So this is just uh, my input in uh, this uh, comparison, characterizing what uh, good governance is. 
Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, Martin, what's uh, what's your take on uh, on uh, the uh, the essence of good governance? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, very hard to speak uh, on the last position uh, because uh, many of the things had already uh, been mentioned by both Peter and Lolita. So uh, instead of putting my Latvian hat on, I will rather put a proud uh, hat of the former student of Yanis uh, and remember his uh, great lectures on the uh, political theory. And uh, I would actually want to come back to the uh, remarks, uh, introductory remarks uh, that we heard this morning and say that for me, the good governance is about uh, principles, is about values and uh, actual application of those. Uh, and for each of us, I mean, these values and these principles mean quite different things. And if we would ask our honorable audience across the screens, we would get like uh, hundreds of uh, different uh, answers on what particular aspects of good governance are super important for them. And I think that it is always coming down to the question of building a system where the citizens of the countries actually uh, believe that the social contract with the state is being secured, that the state is fair, uh, that it is not only preaching about uh, some fundamentals, some principles that are often written uh, very directly in the constitutions of the countries, but they are actually applying those uh, in, in the real life so that they are visible. And so that this can actually create also a trust towards the state, towards uh, the politicians, towards the civil servants. And here we go down to the actual implementation of these principles, of these values, of these fundamentals. And this is exactly where the OECD uh, has been doing quite a bit of the uh, work and what we are constantly doing also uh, working uh, with not only our member countries, but uh, with the countries in the region. Uh, taking uh, from uh, my uh, practical uh, experience, uh, the unit of the OECD where I'm currently employed has generated a set of principles for the public administration that covers not only the things that Peter and Lolita uh, mentioned, but it covers also wider aspects on how the system should work. For example, looking at how the uh, public service should be developed, how it's created, how it should be working, on down to real everyday things that have to be observed if we are gonna call that, yes, our systems are good and the governance machinery, as Lolita said, is able to withstand any challenges uh, that we are currently uh, facing because the volatility, the complexity of the world, and I'm quite sure now we are all over uh, the COVID pandemics. Trust me, in 2021, there will be a further uh, crisis uh, coming and the good governance at the end of the day is a a thing on how we can withstand uh, these crises, how we can create a really a re resilient state and a resilient uh, society that trusts each other and that is able to address any of the challenges uh, that are uh, coming towards us. And this is exactly what we are seeing uh, in all of the regions that we are currently uh, addressing through this uh, conference, be it Central Asia, uh, be it um, Eastern Partnership countries or the Western Balkans, including, of course, the Western Europe and uh, the whole of the world. Okay, uh, so uh, what I uh, gather from uh, uh, your inputs, so basically uh, this good governance is a certain set of principles such as uh, rule of law, accountability, transparency, 
uh, also probably participation in in, in public life, uh, and that uh, generates a, a range of uh, positive uh, changes. For example, well, uh, as Peter mentioned, well, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, potentially uh, get rid of some. Uh, uh, not necessarily very uh, honest uh, managers. You can, you know, uh, have a country uh, better prepared or, 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 or better withstanding certain uh, challenges. And, and also, uh, as Martin mentioned, so it, it's about, you know, basically building the, the, the trust of the general population into a political system and uh, make the political system uh, 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 function better. So there is a range of, uh, of advantages. And I assume that uh, those people, maybe I assume uh, uh, quite optimistically, but, but still, I assume that people who are into uh, public administration who are into politics, they, they they are aware of of these advantages. But we still see that there is a, a great variation in uh, in the extent to which these principles uh, are embraced. So there are countries, uh, well. Uh, to uh, to pick on 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 Peter's uh, example, well, there there are countries where you can lose an important job for uh, uh, paying uh, your uh, dinner with with corporate card, and uh, uh, there are countries where you can um, be involved in uh, shall we say shady deals and uh, still retain the office or even get a promotion. Um, what what what? Why is it happening? Why, why, why are not people appreciating, uh, you know, the good governance? Peter, wh what do you think? Why Denmark has moved to embrace those those principles? Am I to give you a serious answer or is it uh, anecdotal? I mean, we uh, we like to claim, and I think uh, the, our Norwegian brothers and, and Swedish colleagues will uh, neighbors will also join us because we all claim to be vikings of course and and it goes back to the viking age uh, it really does uh, with the vikings uh, meeting on a regular basis the viking chiefs from the different housings uh, gatherings of houses i wouldn't call them towns or villages uh, at that time and and they settle their differences and if someone behaved dishonorably uh, I'm sorry I talk about he's in this case only, but in those days it was the chiefs and they were generally men, I'm sorry, uh, at least as far as records show, and, and you would be punished. So it, it has evolved from that, I think, and you can see that we have had all periods of, of kings who at some stage started to feel that they were nominated by God. And when they did that, they basically fell because the people did not stand for it. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, last but not least, this, this sense of trying to settle things. And, and th when you talk about transparency and you talked about participation, yes, there was this participation and I think we have seen that this evolved into the society that they feel that they were partly responsible always, uh, also. So it was not just the civil servant or the judge who was responsible. It was also people uh, feeling uh, that they had to participate in this application of these principles in practice. So I, I think that's why we see this uh, lower level of acceptance of, of mistakes. And uh, as it was alleged in the case I mentioned before, um, of shady dealing, as you say, uh, we have, of course also have our share of examples of that. Uh, a mayor who gives the road work to the company who just happens to also give him a swimming pool. We have these cases as well, of course. Um, but it's, it's never accepted as okay. 
And this leads me to maybe just one comment I wanted to make to your question um, and, and follow up on a point that you mentioned. Uh, we are talking here about some principles and elements of principles, rule of law, inclusiveness, accountability, transparency, participation. Uh, we also have other elements of, of good governance. But this is not a theoretical discussion. This is really something that individuals, those of our participants who are following the course of the Riga School of, of, uh, uh, of Law, Graduate School of Law, who attend um, this conference here, and their friends who are not yet attending the courses and hopefully will in the future. The point is you can apply these principles and by applying them, you will automatically help your country to move forward and to become resilient as Martins says, to be able to deal with crises. Uh, so I, I think it's very important to, to understand that these things that we are talking about are something that we don't just talk about from an academic point of view. They are real, as you said, Yanis. They are real. They're part of our everyday lives as civil servants or lawyers, even private sector lawyers uh, and judges and prosecutors. We have to apply these. And if we do, we have a society where we can actually focus on dealing with the crises and not first having to to deal with the personal interests. And I mean, we, we can see this. I mean, Lolita, the example you mentioned from Russia, I'm not a big expert in, I, I listen to what you say. Um, I only have the press on which to base myself. So it's interesting to hear your input there. But from the US, I mean, we can see what happens when someone totally disregards the interests of, of governance and of the country for his own personal, not even for his family, for his personal uh, benefit, and that it hasn't worked, but only thanks to America having these 200 years or more of evolving democracy and people have secured some rights and they are fighting for them. And this okay. will also apply in all the countries that are neighboring uh, Europe, whether it's to the east or it's to the south, uh, or now we can even say to the West, uh, with with the countries who are leaving the EU. I mean, we we it is uh, it is vital that we apply these principles and able to establish this trust, so that we can work together with the global uh, crises that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Well, Martin, not all countries have had uh, Vikings in their history. Uh, what what of uh, uh, are other factors perhaps that uh, uh, perhaps encourage th this movement towards good governance? Uh, I would like to actually build on uh, Peter's uh, comparison to the Vikings. It is, uh, th we have our modern day uh, Viking meetings and uh, our uh, modern day uh, Vikings, and I would uh, call them, it's the organized civil society, which plays an immense role in building the good governance, in educating the societies, each member of the society on what these principles are, what they mean in real life, and how they can actually be further taken and built into the systems of the functioning of the country. And I think also the civil society organizations are the ones who are pushing the politicians, the key decision makers, towards a much uh, better application, towards this embracing of the principles of the good uh, governance, that they are following up on these cases when the pre, uh, principles had been breached, when they are not consistently followed. They are bringing experiences from other countries and, and saying, look, if our neighbors can do it, why can't we? 
let's do it uh, exactly like that. And this is the point what we are seeing on the ground in practice happening. This program of the RGSL in terms of educating the new leaders, the future leaders uh, of the countries, it is all about uh, educating people showing a different uh, way how the country can uh, develop. Remember, uh, how was Latvia back in the early 90s? There were certain things that were very important for us, like free and uh, fair elections, rule of law, but we started properly debating the issues related to anti-corruption policy only in the very late uh, 90s, early 2000s, when the society in general, through these different uh, factors, had grown to the level when it becomes important for it, so that it is saying, no, we are not okay with going for forward as we have done. And it's a gradual process, a very incremental process on how things are uh, moving uh, forward in the countries. And I think it is super important to note that the civil society organizations play a huge role uh, in this um, uh, aspect. Because while I agree with Peter that it all starts with us individually observing these principles, not all of us are able to actually think in these ma uh, matters because we have our daily lives to care about. And therefore, we need somebody that helps us understand and see where we should be going. And of course, going gradually. And we definitely see it uh, from the uh, examples in uh, the countries that are the target audience of uh, today's uh, conference, that this is a gradual uh, process, but they are definitely succeeding. Okay, uh, actually, uh, I'm excited to see that um, our discussion is uh, generating questions among the audience. And uh, the first questions are, are coming in and uh, uh, there are a few that are exactly related to what we just uh, discussed. So, and uh, I would like to um, ask, uh, first of all, Lolita and perhaps others could uh, jump in. Uh, should there be a universal standard of good governance? Would such a standard be fair? Thank you, Iyane. Thank you for this question. And I actually uh, would like to um, draw on something that you mentioned um, uh, um, uh, uh, when, uh, when formulating uh, this question and also responding to the uh, question that has come in from, uh, uh, from the participants. You were saying a very important phrase, uh, although you talked about uh, public administration, uh, but I think it refers to both uh, the top political leadership and public uh, administration. You were saying that it's in very important to believe in the ability to get rid of those who are corrupt or those who misperform, who mismanage and so on and so forth. And this ability to get rid of people who do not pr perform both in political office and also in public office uh, in general is something that societies can and should universally agree on. And this uh, universal agreement of how to conduct it are the international standards for good elections. If the elections are conducted in accordance to the universal international standards, uh, uh, the secrecy of vote is observed, uh, the procedures of the elections are in accordance to the laws of the country, um, campaigning uh, gives equal playing uh, field, candidates are registered with no discrimination and so on and so forth. Then the ability of the country to get rid of leaders to whom people have stopped agreeing with uh, is enhanced. And this is a very important mechanism that sends a very important signal throughout all layers of governance, because this gives a signal that institutions can operate independently their fate is not dependent upon the guy on the top. And this is the case in the US, the examples that I mentioned uh, uh, in my first response, uh, where 
the secretaries of states who are responsible for managing elections in the states of the United States, they know that they can operate independently in accordance to the previously designed procedures. They don't have to transgress these procedures so that to please the leader and, um, uh, and, and um, they can move only if there is a procedural basis for that. And this is the good governance principles uh, that uh, uh, are universally signaled by the process of elections, basically saying, okay, your four years are up and you have to leave. And of course we are seeing with someone like President Trump, he is like an aching infected tooth. It's very hard to extract him. But on 20th of January, he will be kicked out. And that will happen if we have trust. And I think we, there is a reason to have trust in democracies. So actually what was uh, just talking about these universal principles, uh, and the uh, magazine, uh, The Economist, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, they had actually the whole issue devoted to how resilient is democracy. And they had this one wonderful quote about the electoral processes. They said, having not mattered enough, elections now matter too much. There is too much hinging to conduct elections in accordance to democratic universal standards and actually have people's will expressed. And what is the big difference between the process that we saw in the US and the process that we see, saw in Russia during the pandemic time was this all Russian vote, which wasn't even a referendum, which extended uh, the ability of President Vladimir Putin to govern the country up until 2036. So here we see how uh, these universal principles are observed or not observed. Thank okay, you. Um, uh, Peter, Martin, sh should there be a, a universal standard of good governance? If uh, I may, um, I think that they are already and uh, they are being created by a very uh, wide variety of uh, international organizations, be it the United Nations system, be it the OECD, the World Bank, the International uh, Monetary Fund, uh, different other uh, organizations. Also academics are uh, creating uh, those principles. There is a vast amount of literature on good governance, on governance itself, on uh, the reform process and about the successes and challenges of uh, these uh, reforms. At the same time, I'm not quite sure that uh, we should be saying that, look, this is the one set of the only truths uh, that we are having regarding the uh, good governance principles. And why I say it, because it very much would go sometimes against certain uh, cultural aspects of uh, the societies. It might not be taken as stemming from their historic uh, past and, and understanding about the things, um, some co other uh, issues. So I uh, would rather opt for this multilateral explanation of what the good governance is, and let the societies take uh, the best things that uh, work for them. But and doesn't... of course, we are seeing that the societies who feel uh, more alike or group around the certain values and uh, principles, they are creating their communities. Like, uh, let's take the European uh, Union. It is a union of the countries who want to share the same values and principles. And this is exactly uh, what is uh, happening on the daily basis. And therefore we are commonly jointly creating and applying uh, these principles of good governance in the EU. Also our partner countries who, are, who have the aspiration for the uh, EU membership or a closer integration with the uh, European uh, values, they are trying to pick up uh, the principles of good governance and implement them, those uh, that work currently for them. Martin, but it, don't you risk some sort of a cherry picking here? If you say, okay, you know, 
here is a full menu uh, of certain principles uh, of good uh, good governance, and you're free to choose. Uh, would they work in isolation? I am saying that, uh, Yanis, that uh, there is actually no pool uh, to cherry uh, pick. There is uh, just too wide understanding of what are the uh, good governance principles and how uh, I perceive them. And this is uh, where I started uh, my answer to, to the first question, is that if we would now ask the participants of the conference to define what are the principles of uh, good governance, we wouldn't be able to count the answers because they would be so different. And this is being impacted by their experience, by their uh, cultural uh, background, by their understanding of what is good and what is bad. I'm saying that therefore, I'm not quite sure that it would be able to create a universal set of uh, these uh, principles. And I wouldn't be worried about the cherry picking because taking one step at a time towards the good governance means that there is a high probability that you will be taking the next step. Okay, I, I see that Peter is actively nodding and uh, apparently agreeing with uh, this uh, uh, incremental approach. Uh, and uh, my uh, question uh, 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 mirrors what has been asked uh, uh, by some of our uh, participants. Okay, if, if you uh, move gradually, uh, w would it be realistic to introduce a functioning set of some uh, principles of good governance? Uh, although I don't, uh, you know, I'm quite divided on whether there is or is not a set of uh, principles because, you know, there are even certain uh, um, international organizations that have defined uh, whatever, is it nine or, 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 or uh, 12 uh, principles of good governance. But uh, do you think that this gradual approach could result in a, you know, in an adoption of, uh, say uh, a majority of those uh, principles by 2030 uh, you know one of our uh, uh, listeners wants to know about exactly this date so essentially you know how long do you think this incremental change would take to uh, you know uh, result in a, a situation or in a, a, a state of affairs when you can talk about you know having uh, something that resembles good governance Peter. This is a very good question. Um, listen, um, as you just mentioned, universal principles for good governance, and you just mentioned, I mean, a simple Google shirt, uh, search will show you that there's anything from eight to 12, and I even found 33 principles of good governance. I, I have to say, I didn't get to explore the last one. I didn't have time to read all 33. <clears throat> but what I did uh, notice was that all of them have the same eight, nine principles. So in fact, there, yeah, there are some fundamental, uh, there are some universal concepts that are evolving in, in, in different <clears throat> excuse me, different settings and in different organizations and in different countries, and they tend to overlap. Secondly, <clears throat> I, I wanted to, to follow up on one of the points uh, mentioned uh, by, by Martins, and that is this step-by-step -step approach. Good governance costs money. I mean, it, it, it costs money because you have to be able to pay people so that they can afford to apply the rule of law, equal access, not be tempted. I remember some of the countries we worked with in the past who are now members of the EU. <clears throat> in one of those countries, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not COVID. Uh, uh, but uh, simply dryness of the room, I'm afraid. Um, the, um, 
we were training some judges, young judges in um, in ethics, actually, uh, and about the rule of law. And uh, in that, uh, among the young uh, judges, uh, one of them pulled me aside during the coffee break. And he said, you know, we would love to arrive at the situation that you're describing. But what, when, what do you do when you are a young civil servant or you're a young judge, you are married, you have a, a child maybe, uh, and um, you are earning $250 a month and your child gets sick. And in this country, there was no, there were free hospitals, but you would have to pay yourself for any treatment and any medicine. And on $250, you could not afford this. So what do you do when suddenly someone comes up to you and says, I have this case and I want this to be the decision. And they're going to pay you in one go the equivalent of one year of salary. That will help you pay for the treatment of your child <laughs> in the hospital. So my point is, when we are talking about these principles, they are absolutely, as we have said, it is, it is possible to implement. It starts with the individual. So each of our participants who are watching today, it, you will have to take the courage to say that you're not going to stand for bullying and that you will be applying the law as it is written and as it is intended. And if we start with that, that will already be in the future when you become a manager that you can start to instill these values that you have uh, all talked about uh, into the new generation of people and into your colleagues. This is how we start taking one step at a time. And if we start Today, I know I start sounding like a politician, which I am not. I'm a practitioner, a simple lawyer. But if we start today, and as Martin said, we have to start with one step at a time, because with, if we've taken one step, we have also, our, our, our society will also have become a bit richer because we start being a place that other countries want to invest in there starts to be legal certainty. And if there is legal certainty, companies are willing to invest. And if they invest, we will have economic and we will have social development and we can move on to the next steps in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, of the implementation of these principles. I'm sorry, my phone, even if I put it on silent, it started to ring. I should have turned it off altogether. But just to conclude, I fully agree with Martins. Uh, we have to introduce step one step at a time. And each time we do it, our country becomes more interesting for neighbors and for people with money. I mean, companies who are willing to invest, who are willing to give jobs, which allows our country to become richer and therefore afford the next step. And if we all start, just the individual civil servant starts to apply these principles to their own work, I think, yes. I don't think the 2030 deadline is so totally unrealistic, even with the pandemic. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, we have uh, uh, essentially a follow-up question from the audience. Uh, and uh, th this is a, a question I would like to, uh, uh, first of all, direct to, to Lolita. If, if, if you were to choose one priority for the next 10 years in the sphere of uh, good governance, what would it be? What, what would you work on, uh, you know, within apparently the framework of this gradual approach. Lolit, what, what would be your choice? Um, thank you, Yanis. It's, uh, it's a very tough question, actually, because um, um, prioritizing is something definitely, it's, it's, a, 
it's a it's it's the usual policy prescription to all reform processes. Uh, get your priorities and focus on your priorities. However, I think that uh, when we are talking about good governance, one aspect that we should really remember, and this is what we started off with, is this ability of the system to rebalance itself uh, and withstand pressures and respond to the challenges. And as a rule of thumb, the system will not be able to rebalance itself if it is not multifaceted, if it does not have several strong points, several strong points that can pull through when others weaken. So basically what I would say that it is very difficult to make sure or to, to design a policy that you will be prioritizing only one area of the governance. And uh, this actually brings me back to the gradual approach that Martin mentioned. And uh, uh, here I would really like to evoke the uh, experience of Latvia. And uh, we have seen that through the many crises that we have faced, one branch of our governance is failing and then the others are being able to step in. If we would only prioritize on strengthening, for instance, the executive, we would only uh, 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 focus on strengthening the judiciary. We would invest uh, in civil society, but not make sure that the uh, legislative branch is able to actually listen and respond to what the civil society is requesting. Uh, we would be denying ourselves of an ability to strengthen this rebalancing resilience. This is what we uh, started off with. So unfortunately, I would say that for an overall strengthening of uh, good governance, you need this incrementalism. So it's basically like the European Union integration. You need deepening and widening simultaneously. You have to, in a gradual way, strengthen the capacity of all important balancing elements of the governance and do it gradually over time. So for this, of course, it is important to define what are the important elements uh, I mentioned, executive, legislative, uh, civil society, media, judiciary, and to gradually build capacity of each of them. Because when the crisis hits, if one sector fails, the other one will step in. Okay, uh, Martin, what is your uh, uh, first step? Um, it's it's really a very uh, hard and a very good question from uh, the audience because there is no uh, silver uh, bullet uh, answer that uh, we can give. And I would like to totally agree with uh, Lolita that there needs to be this balance of the powers um, that um, makes it possible to rebalance uh, things, to uh, make uh, the system more fit. However, if I would be uh, to choose and if I would have to build on the experience that I have had both in Latvia but also uh, everywhere uh, else in the countries, I would actually try to invest the most attention to what uh, Peter mentioned uh, in his response uh, to the very first uh, question. Uh, for me, it would be the rule of law. Strengthening the rule of law, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but for me, strengthening the rule of law, the system that enshrines it and makes the application possible would be the one because for me the rule of law means safeguarding the principles they are the watchdog and i don't want to enter the details of the latest developments of the uh, latvian uh, actual uh, things but we really see that it's the legislative branch that is becoming more and more important in shaping uh, different policies and maintaining that we as a society, despite we might agree or disagree with some aspects, that we are trying to stick to 
uh, what is written and prescribed by the law. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yet another question, and uh, uh, ironically, it somehow uh, 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 relates in, in this uh, uh, apologetic remark by, by Peter, uh, saying that, well, I don't have COVID, uh, congratulations. No, no irony here. Uh, but uh, the question is, okay, if we adopt this gradual approach, uh, and for example, Martin says, uh, let's start with the rule of law. Uh, do you see uh, any impact of COVID uh, on this? Essentially, is there, uh, and, and uh, this is perhaps a broader question, you know, uh, do uh, big crises, uh, uh, be it COVID or, or some terrorism or w whatever, uh, do they somehow affect what you can do uh, in the area of uh, building good governance and uh, pursuing uh, uh, the implementation of those principles? Peter. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to uh, let's say divide your question into two parts because a pandemic the effects of the pandemic and then the effects of, for example, terrorism or the threat of terrorism and, and the impact, they're two different things, at least from my perspective. But if we look at the first one, I think that if I could, let's say, make a direct link to what uh, both um, Lolita and Martin said before, we need to rebalance, uh, a society needs to rebalance itself it needs to be more inclusive. And then uh, the focus on rule of law, which I, I have to say, not just because I am a lawyer, but simply because it is a fundamental basis on which to ensure trust in, in a territory or in, in, in a community, and therefore the willingness for people to work with it to make it grow. Uh, so in addition to, to, to I really think that there will, you cannot just focus on one single priority area. I think you have to look into different ones. And I think we're forgetting one very important one. And here I answer directly to your question about the pandemia, the effect of it. Where is it hurting us the most is probably in the field of education. All these principles we've talked about, rule of law, inclusiveness, the participation, constructive participation in a society requires that people have learned to think. And this requires that they have had access to a proper education. And this is one thing that I would say we see right now with populism that has been on the rise and now hopefully we have seen the turn of populism and it starts uh, returning to, to uh, lesser degrees, is that people are informed, that people can learn to think. And we have been cutting for years and years and years on education, on the justice sector, um, and also in public administration, so that there are not sufficient resources to actually apply all the rules that we are adopting. So. In my view, uh, this is a priority as well. The inclusiveness, the ability ensuring that the country allows for a, re a possibility to rebalance itself, the rule of law so that we make sure that this rebalancing actually takes place. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then finally, uh, the education so that people can take uh, informed uh, choices and maybe learn not to, 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 to be in a society where there is not a black and white, it's typically gray, so we have to compromise so that we can all maybe not love it, but live with it. Um, with regard to the terrorism point, very briefly, terrorism is raising its ugly head, not just affecting uh, limbs and, li and lives of individuals who are the victims of this. But of course, while we all want a safe and secure society, 
is also giving uh, restrictive rules and more powers to law enforcement. Now, if we are good citizens and we are abiding to the law, we don't mind. But there are will be things where where is the borderline between intrusiveness in a, in controlling us, monitoring us and our communications, and what is needed for the uh, for the safety of the realm, for the country. This is a very tricky question, uh, and uh, it. So terrorism has a totally different impact, and I would say leads to a slightly different question, but it will never justify deviating from the rule of law. That means that any intrusiveness on an individual has to be according to the law. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Lolit, do you, do you see uh, any uh, uh, impact of, of pandemic, uh, either short term or long term? Uh, of course, of course, uh, pandemic uh, is uh, actually a very interesting phenomena in terms of it hitting everyone uh, uh, in a symmetric way. It's not an asymmetric crisis. Peter was talking about terror uh, and terrorism, and usually it's hitting a country or a particular place asymmetrically. So. <clears throat> Very often we are either embroiled in uh, one particular spot or we are observers of what is happening. And when it comes to COVID, it's hit us all symmetrically. We all suffer, everyone su suffers. And uh, for that reason, of course, it is posing a huge stress test on all systems, on political leadership, on public administration, on education systems, incredibly on health uh, care uh, systems, everything. Every, every, everyone and everything is being under this uh, stress test. And for this reason, uh, there are some fundamentals that really uh, challenge good governance of a country. First of all, its ability to display leadership, a reasonable leadership, not to tell sweet lies, but to actually present tough truths and to actually be able to explain and enforce uh, these uh, tough truths about the fact that we need to distance, we need to stop the economies and whatnot. The, and for that reason, the implementation level is very important. And it is very important that it happens within the rule of law, that the procedures that are agreed at uh, the top level uh, by the leadership are actually implemented as they are supposed to, and also understood by the public administration. For that reason, of course, it is a huge stress test too. And second, what is very important, it's a huge uh, trust, uh, stress test on societies. If the societies have fair degree of belief and trust that their leadership is really operating in their best interest, they will cooperate and comply. And we've seen societies that cooperate and comply because they trust their leadership. And we've seen societies which do not cooperate, which do not comply, where things like wearing masks are becoming a political statement, unfortunately, due to poor leadership. So this is stress testing all layers of uh, systems. And there are good examples to learn from, and there are terrible examples to learn from. OK. Um... As as you were discussing these these issues, in in one way or another, uh, the issue of 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 people's attitudes uh, came up. So uh, it's about what people think, how they uh, what what attitudes they have towards themselves, towards politicians, towards uh, the government, and so on and so forth. And it is well known in sociology that you know uh, it, it takes time sometimes it takes a long time uh for attitudes to change and uh the natural question and sometimes it's even generational you know we we, t we talk about you know uh generation x we talk about boomers and uh you know uh it, it, do you see uh that this change of attitudes could be somehow sped up so that it could you know uh, happen faster, sort of within our lifetime, so to speak. 
Peter? Oh, you've seen a lot. <laughs> I, I have to say that I find that a very tricky question. Do we, we see it within our lifetime, a change of attitude? Sadly, what we see is very, it's very easy to learn bad habits. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to, to unlearn bad habits and learn good habits. Uh, and, and we've seen that in, in all countries, uh, whether old members or new members of the EU. Um, I do come back to the, uh, I'm sorry if I now start uh, sounding like a record, but I do come back to the question of education. If we invest in education, and I don't just talk about training at IPA, but I'm talking about education generally. <laughs> uh, uh, we will, people will be able, more people will be able to think, to think abstractly as well. Uh, and if they can think abstractly, it also becomes easier for the individual to evaluate whether the practice they're having is a good one and or whether it could be to the common good uh, to, uh, to, to, to change that. I mean, also in, in our own interest to change our behavior. So is it possible? Yes. Um, what we have seen is that we have seen despots through the years who have cut on the education. It was a, a practice started already uh, by uh, uh, of the example that I know best of is, is in, in, in Spain under Franco, where he, ate, where it was a very clear policy that people should not learn foreign languages so they wouldn't be inspired about what was happening in other countries particular democratic ideas. Yeah. Um, we've seen similar approaches in, in other countries when someone feels, I don't have a strong argument, but I, I will cut on education. And it has had an impact on those countries. We have seen a growth and development in, in bad practices. So if, if countries are willing to invest in education, as well as in the public administration and in the judiciary uh, uh, to ensure that our country can become wealthier and people can see the benefit. Yes, I think it is something we will see in our lifetime. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, as, as we are drawing to uh, uh, a conclusion of, of our panel, um, there is a, uh, yet another question from the audience. Uh, and uh, Perhaps I would I would like to uh, first of all direct this question to Martin, who uh, uh, has, uh, among other uh, things, uh, a uh, rich uh, consultancy experience uh, in in, um, uh, in 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 the region. And uh, the question is, what are the main challenges in the uh, uh, Eastern, partnership, Eastern Partnership region for public administration reform? If you would, Martin, take now, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of a, you know, a, a big, big uh, look from uh, the heights of your uh, experience, not only at our OECD, but also uh, from your work. Uh, in the in in that region, what what would you single out as as main challenges? Um, thanks. Uh, I guess we would need another uh, panel uh, to answer this because it's uh, such a wide uh, question that requires a very wide answer. But I will draw not only on my um, current and previous uh, experience in advising the countries on how to build uh, better uh, governance systems but also on the Latvian experience, whom I know uh, inside out uh, from the very ins of the uh, system. And first and foremost, I think what we are lacking in order to say that we would be successful with the public administration uh, reforms is uh, a lack of a deep understanding of the decision makers 
uh, and uh, lack of the ownership of these uh, reforms. Because sadly enough, in very many cases, these reforms that we are speaking about are externally driven. They are sometimes imposed uh, by the development uh, partners and they are not felt from within the system that yes, uh, we actually need to take these steps because it's for a uh, better good. And uh, yet again, there is now one silver uh, bullet. I'm quite sure that the audience that is listening to us will be among those who will be transforming their countries based on the educational insights that the RGSL and all other educational institutions have provided them with on the, this critical thinking, uh, but uh, also on the uh, strong push from the societies. And uh, yet again, I want to come back to the civil society, uh, the importance of the civil society organizations in drawing the attention that uh, the public administration reforms are not done just because there is some uh, external pressure, just because it is so much stressed in each communication of the European uh, Union, but rather that it would help the countries and the, their leaderships to build something that is getting better results for the societies, for their citizens. And coming back to the previous question on the impact of the pandemics, I think in the partnership uh, region, we see very many good examples of the countries introducing fast responses and very good uh, examples of improving the service uh, delivery to the citizens using the new reality and the new tools. While this is being done, it's not always seen as part of the public administration uh, reform, sadly enough, but this is exactly what can uh, draw it or push it uh, further. And to finalize my long talk, and sorry uh, for that, I think that really the um, political leadership, their understanding and their willingness to reform things for the better sake of their citizens is the core. And this in turn is what we had been talking all around this one hour and something. It's about good governance. Um, uh, Peter, uh, you know, based on your uh, experience, uh, you know, uh, again, on, uh, on, on, um, work in, 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 in this region, what, what do you see as, as the main challenge? I think that the points have, have just been mentioned actually by Martins and also by Lolita before. Um, if I could just uh, stress, I fully agree that all these reform as, uh, issues that we're talking about and the need for public administration reform and for good governance and rule of law, respect for that. It is not, it is very important that it is felt as an internal need to improve the society and not just something from, from outside. And I think that this is what I would say was one of the good practices, good examples the good experiences I've had because I've been working with candidate and accession countries to the EU back from when Sweden and Finland uh, joined and uh, Norway decided to, to delay its membership of the EU. Uh, um, to see all these countries uh, the, the 10 who joined in 2004, the two who joined uh, in 2007, the one who joined in 2012, is to see how they have turned their societies around in our lifetime. In some cases, it took 10 years, 20 years, <clears throat> but it was possible. And they realized that these developments were not just in order to join the club, 
it was actually to the benefit of the country. So I think, yes, I think it is possible and I think it is important. I think it's important to, to supplement what Martin says, people are, are participants and their friends and their colleagues that they learn to think and that they're not afraid of thinking critically, but also constructively. Uh, how do we achieve something that we don't always think about, I will lose, you will win, but we are thinking of making the cake bigger. I'm sorry, I take things here from negotiation theory, but it is actually true. How can we find ways to include the interests of as many as possible, rather than just trying to find narrow solutions that benefits a few. And last but not least, on the point of civil society, and here's a point I feel very strongly about, and that is really based on my own experience as a civil servant. And again, an evolution that I've seen take place in all the countries who have joined since 2004. Initially, civil, uh, civil society was seen as a threat to government. They were a nuisance. Uh, they were a pain. They kept pointing at things that we should do better. <laughs> but that is their role. And in fact, what civil society is for government is it is the friend of government because it is a free resource. It's a free resource of experience, of, of knowledge, then it's up to government. And that means civil servants because they are drafting the laws and the politicians who give the political direction is of course to find the, the, the middle way. But a, a, a civil society, they are of course feeling very strongly the, 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 um, the Greenpeace are very vocal about environmental protection. Then you have some who say, yeah, but we need to also think about uh, uh, children. We need to think about the rights of women. We need to think about the rights of animals. All these interest groups are crucial. Yes, they are narrow-minded, but that is their job. But just to round off, it's important to know that they are a free resource of expertise and inspiration to government. And then we, as civil servants, will adjust it to be a realism. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lolita, what, what are your uh, concluding observations on uh, the uh, reform public administration <laughs> and the main challenges in, in the region here? Uh, yes, I would uh, probably in this uh, response draw to my um, experience uh, as a lawmaker, as a member of parliament in Latvia, and also uh, from the experience that I've had over the last two years uh, working with uh, reform of particular uh, sectors and policies in Eastern Partnership countries. And um, it is just um, what I feel is that um, for members of parliaments, it is somehow really very difficult to do the right thing. They very rarely are up to being really able to conduct inclusive process uh, through which many of the very many very good policy prescriptions that are uh, prepared in numerous reports by the international consultants that at least a small fraction of it is actually implemented. And from the perspective of a politician, I know the challenges to what extent it really it is difficult to move any far reaching agenda. The hurdles that you have to overcome to even have a small fraction of it is uh, very tough because uh, there are all these intermingling and self-defeating and others defeating attitudes and, and actions and everything. So it's one big process which results in very little. And what I have really seen, there are two things that can jumpstart and make sure that things move forward. And they have been mentioned both by Martin, both uh, by Peter, by you, Yanis. These are two things, international pressure serious international pressure was uh, really serious leverage, uh, even threatening to remove 
some things or to have the country removed from access to some, uh, uh, some policies, benefits or funding and very serious pressures from the civil society. On both, when these two things combine, I've seen this polit political, um, uh, uh, political decision-making somehow bulge and, uh, and move, but it's very difficult. And if anything, uh, having been the uh, activist of civil society, it is actually a very tough work because the demands are huge. Uh, the ability to respond in a quality way to all of them is very tough. So actually what I think is very important to consider uh, that more of the support of international community that goes for policy making, uh, specifically in Eastern partnership countries, probably even more, a bigger fraction of it should be directed towards uh, bolstering the ability of civil society. Uh, but of course there are difficulties. There are countries which uh, uh, term their civil society organizations uh, uh, foreign agents if uh, they receive foreign funding. So uh, their uh, challenges amount too. Okay, uh, 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 I hate to uh, break this discussion and uh, particularly because we have not uh, been uh, able to address all the questions that uh, have been asked by uh, our audience, but I believe that uh, our discussion uh, highlighted uh, actually various uh, positive sides, various benefits of, uh, of good governance. Uh, how a good governance can impact uh, individual lives and how uh, good governance can impact uh, entire countries, entire political systems. But also <laughs> there are bad news. And the bad news is that this change is not going to uh, happen overnight. So this is going to be a long and demanding process. And secondly, uh, this is not something that you can order for delivery. So you have to be part of that. You have to be participate. You have to contribute uh, to this goal on a daily basis in whichever function you find yourself, be it a civil servant, be it uh, an NGO activist, or being a, uh, a politician elected uh, official. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank... Um, uh, each uh, panelist uh, that uh, kindly agreed to share uh, her or his uh, views and experience with us. I also want to thank uh, 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 authors of uh, the questions, and I certainly encourage you to uh, 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 follow uh, this uh, uh, conference uh, throughout the day. Thank you very much, and see you in the next panel.